Hey everyone, my name is Sean. I'm from a company called Crafted Elements. Now, if you're not familiar with our company, let me give you a quick background. We started this company here in Guelph, Ontario, Canada as a kind of a side business. And we've turned into the largest maker of silicone molds and templates for woodworkers and resin artists in potentially the world. We have over 200 different, very thick, super durable silicone molds. And we have 250 plus and counting uh, router template designs as of this time. We also do some other time saving tools like router sleds. So if you aren't familiar with our company, that's kind of the gist of it. But what I'm here to do today is show you how our unique line of molds and our unique line of matching templates for said molds are gonna help you become a better maker or woodworker. Now this is gonna be whether you are just beginning or you're at the advanced kind of upper end level. Now I say that because if you're just getting into working with resin or maybe you're working with resin and wood and you're new to this, these molds will simplify the entire process for you as well, of course, these templates. And if you are uh, a veteran of the woodworking game or you've been working with wood and resin to make cutting boards and things like that for some years now, you'll appreciate the time it saves you. Not just how easy it is, but the physical time and materials saved by using these molds and templates. So in this video, we're going to be looking at the warped rectangle. I don't know, we're not really good with the names here at Craft Elements sometimes. This is the best I can come up with. It started as a rectangle, it got bloated, and now it's got two handles on the edges. So we've got uh, probably 20 or 30 shakuri board molds. Uh, so thick molds like this with built-in handles with matching templates. Now, why would you need a matching template? Well, if you're just putting resin in this thing and you're not using any wood, you don't need a template. If you're a resin artist, you could definitely fill this thing up, quarter inch, half inch, one inch, and make a solid resin piece. But if you are a woodworker or you want to combine wood and resin, then this template is gonna make your life so much easier because you can use this template to pre-cut your piece of wood, put it in the mold, pour your resin around it, and not only save wasted resin, but save time shaping this thing. Now, if you do not want to use resin, maybe you're like one of those woodworkers who are like anti-resin, resin isn't woodworking, that's fine, cool. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. You can use just this template to create solid wood boards. So I'm gonna make two projects in this video using both of these pieces, our warped re rectangle mold and our matching warped rectangle template. So you can see just how powerful these are when they're combined. Let's get started. Go ahead and switch to the over the shoulder approach so you can watch what I'm doing in real time. As I said earlier, we have the greatest selection of silicone molds, particularly molds for making pre-shaped cutting boards. You can visit craftedelements.com for an exhaustive list and check them out. And pretty much for every single one of our cutting board molds, we have a cutting board template. Now, what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna take the protective paper off this guy so you can see how these templates work. So I've got our template fully unwrapped and you'll immediately notice that it's designed to mimic the shape of the cutting board, including those handles. Now I generally don't like to cut out these handles um, when I'm shaping wood because it is still a very tight, very hard fit. So what I'm gonna do is put this to the side. I'm gonna grab a piece of wood. Now this is not an amazing piece. It's a little bit, it's a lot bit wonky, but it's gonna serve the purpose uh, for, for this video. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take our template and of course being clear, you're literally gonna to get to preview how the wood is going to look in your mold because you of course have the matching shape to match your mold. So I'm gonna go ahead and do something sorta of like this. It's just enough to kind of look kind of neat. You got some of that crotch in there from the walnut and you're not going to interfere with these handles. I don't have to cut around these handles. Not that I couldn't, but it just makes things a little bit more difficult. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab a pencil or pen and just trace the line around the template. And remove that template. Okay, so now we've got our template drawn on the wood. We're gonna take this and cut this out away from this line. So you'll see these lines that we made. We do not wanna cut on the line. We're gonna do that with the template and our router bit later. We wanna cut away from that line, anywhere from 1 16th you know, to 1 8th, maybe at most 1 quarter inch. How you cut this is completely up to you. Jigsaw, bandsaw, scroll saw, 
freaking handsaw, whatever you want to do. I'm going to use a combination uh, right now to show you how I would do it, but of course use the tools in your shop that you have available. Guys, I want to reiterate, yes, I did use a bandsaw. You know, it's a $1,500 machine. Not everyone has one. I could have done the same thing. It just would have taken me longer with a $150, $200 jigsaw like this. You're going to get the same effect, but if you got the tools, you use them, right? All right, so now you'll see that we've got that piece traced. We can still see the line. We've got some, what I just say in every single video if you've watched before, meat on the bones. Okay, you've got some wood still left over. We want to mimic this, but first what I'm going to do, um, because it's going to be really hard to attach this template to a warped piece of wood, I'm not going to exactly sit straight, is I'm going to just quickly plane this piece down to get it a little bit more usable and straight so we can put it in our mold. All right, the piece is straighter than it was. Our planer took a little bit of a chunk off the side of that. It's fine. Uh, again, we're putting this in our mold, we're filling it with resin, so the resin is going to fill up any imperfections, and once we take it out of the mold, we're going to have to plane the entire thing anyway. So as long as it sits a little nicer than it was, we're good. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my template, and I'm going to heat up my hot glue gun to attach the template to the wood. Now while my glue gun is heating up, I'm just going to quickly explain some other options for attaching these templates to the wood. First of all, you've got two-sided tape, pretty self-explanatory. You take some pieces of this down, you put it on your wood or template, you merge them together, and voila, they stick. Then there's also the CA glue and masking tape method. So it's actually like creating your own two-sided tape. You're putting down tape on the template, tape on the wood, CA glue and an activator in between it, pressing them down and effectively merging them together. The advantage of this method is that you get very, very fine, or rather, you don't have a lot of thickness there. When you're using two-sided tape, it's generally thicker, so you get a nice close contact with the board, and it's really easy to take off, uh, unlike, say, hot glue or the two-sided tape method. I honestly prefer the hot glue method. Uh, one, it's easy. Two, it's easy to have hot glue on hand. Uh, and three, it doesn't really matter if the glue kind of sticks or smears up your wood, because again, you're pouring resin on into the mold with this wood, and they're going to run it through the planer anyway, so any sort of imperfection left on the wood is going to be gone in the final finishing stage. But you choose to do what you feel most comfortable doing. My glue gun should be kind of ready to go by now. Oh, yeah, there we go. All right. So I'm just going to put a liberal amount of glue in a few different places, enough to hold that template in place. And kind of line up with those lines that I had set up before, if possible. And just press and hold while that glue sets. Now at this point you may be asking, how do you get rid of the rest of that material? You cut it kind of intentionally rough and you left most of it there. Well, that's where the flush trim router bit and a router or a router cable comes in. So this is a standard quarter inch flush trim router bit and it is essentially a bladed cutter or a cutter bit with a, um, a bearing on it. So you can get top mounted bearings or rear or, or bottom mounted bearings. They both function in the same way. The idea is that bearing is going to ride against your template and the cutter is going to ride against the wood, essentially matching or, or mimicking the template to the wood. If you don't follow, watch this. So we've got our router bit in there. We're going to line up our bearing with the template and the blade cutter part with the wood. Looks pretty good there. And lock this in place. Now you're going to want to oppose the direction of spin. So if the blade or if the um, if the bit's spinning this way, we're pushing this way. We don't want to go with the spin, otherwise you're going to end up boom, losing your board. I'm going to turn this on. I'll show you what I mean.
Okay, done. So we're gonna go ahead and pop this template off the wood. Um, sometimes you can get it with your hand, but by flexing it, you don't wanna to pull too hard because you do not wanna crack the template. It is acrylic, so it can crack. So sometimes you might need a little spatula or a screwdriver and just do it really gently and then clean up the rest after. All right, you can take that glue off after and then we'll just do that with the remaining glue on the wood. And again, it doesn't really matter if it's stained because once we put epoxy in the mold with this and then demold it and plane it, all that's kind of hidden anyway. All right, so we are almost ready to put this back in the mold, which now that it's pre-shaped, but we do want to get rid of this excess bark because you do not want to put, you know, anything, any loose materials, especially bark, uh, in the mold because your epoxy will bond with the bark, possibly fall off or fall away. So for that bark removal, you'll use something called a draw knife, bark removal knife. Get them from Amazon. This one's a uh, beaver craft. Sounds fancy. But we're going to strap this down and then pull against here to take the bark off. Most of the bark is actually already off this piece to begin with. It's kind of just some remnants left. Does not have to be perfect, but you'll want to get it as much as possible. And you can actually use a high, a low grit uh, sandpaper and a power sander to take the rest of it off. Anything you can't get with this draw knife. Piece of wood is fully shaped and prepped. Watch the magic. like a glove. All right, so you'll notice that the wood's sitting a little bit higher than the mold. Doesn't matter. Um, you don't want it too insanely high, but again, we're gonna pour the epoxy in here, we're gonna demold it. We've gotta run this through the planer in the end anyway. So we're gonna level it after. So if the, the wood is sitting a bit proud, because in this case it's warped, um, doesn't matter. We're gonna get rid of it at the finishing stages. But, and before we actually do our pour, we actually want to Use some mold release. Mold release is something that for some reasons people choose to forget or often forget or choose to ignore, I don't know. But you wanna use mold release, a non-silicone based mold release. We've got the MAN 200, 300, MG Chemicals 8329. A non-silicone based mold release within these thick silicone molds is going to do wonders. It's gonna make the project easier to demold and it's gonna make your mold last longer. You're gonna get 15, 20, 30 uses out of this mold with the proper mold release miss a couple of mold releases and you will probably damage your mold and these are not cheap okay as you can imagine by the sound of and the weight the whole desk shook not cheap molds so you want to make sure to use a mold release to ensure that they last as long as possible so we're going to go ahead wear a respirator i'm not going to in this case i'm just going to turn my fans on and i've got some giant shop fans really big shop fans uh to make sure that everything's kind of flowing that way Make sure you coat all the surfaces, handle area, etc. And let it sit for about five minutes to dry. Now, while we're letting that dry, we can actually talk about epoxy. So Total Boat has been, has long been our epoxy supplier here at Craft Elements. Uh, they send us product to review and feature in our videos, and we're quite happy with them. So you can actually head over to totalboat.com and purchase your own epoxy now. The question we get a lot, um, and we do have this in our facts section, but which epoxy do I use? Well, really it comes down to volume, but most people are not calculating volume, they're just looking at depth. So generally you can look at depth of pour. This is a one inch mold, total boat thick set is going to be the choice for that. It is good for up to one inch pours. If you're doing river tables or something that has, you know, two, three inches, then you want to move to total boat thick set fathom. If you're just doing layers or you're doing art, epoxy or, or whatever you're making very very thin casting you could use total boat tabletop epoxy or mega epoxy but in this case we're going to use total boat thick set which is generally what i use 80 percent of the time because i do not make any tables here um, it's generally smaller projects like this so this is a three to one ratio which means three plus one it's four parts if you had a two to one ratio two plus one is three parts so a little bit of math here 
but you're going to want to figure out how much epoxy to make or to, to mix up. Now, if you were just going to pour epoxy in this mold without any wood, very easy to figure out because we actually published the data, um, the fluid volume data of all of our molds on the product pages of our website. So you can go to the website, it'll tell you 60 ounces, 50 ounces, 300 ounces, whatever it is, and you can mix that up and be pretty accurate from there. But in this case, we're putting wood in our mold. So once you put the wood in, you're gonna realize that you don't need as much epoxy. So you can either eyeball it or you could actually calculate it out. So how do you calculate it out? Like this. We know we have two voids here. We know the mold's one inch deep. We're gonna use that full one inch of pour. So we're essentially pouring all the way to the brim here. So what you can do is actually measure this. So that's say seven by four, and then this is eight by an average of three. So once you multiply seven times four, and then eight by three, you're gonna come up with your cubic inches number. You're gonna then go to Google or just apply the formula to convert cubic inches to ounces or milliliters, depending on which system or volume you are using. So in this case, we've got 52 cubic inches, which we're gonna to convert to ounces and mix up the epoxy accordingly. Now, it certainly doesn't hurt to mix up a little extra epoxy. In fact, I'd encourage it 10 to 15% more because you're gonna have, of course, epoxy left in your container, maybe a missed measure, maybe miscalculated, whatever it is. So in this case, we're gonna need about 28 ounces of epoxy, but to keep things um, more accurate, I'm gonna actually just round up to the next level of 32 ounces. So I'm gonna make eight, one, two, three, um, eight ounces of hardener, which is the part one, three, um, three parts or 24 ounces of resin, which is the three part of this epoxy equation. If that doesn't make sense, write it down. It'll be very, very clear. Four parts, three to one. And in this case, I'm going to go up to 32 ounces. So you've got eight and 24 to get 32. All right. So I've got my total boat hardener into my fan back on. Eight ounces of hardener and 24 ounces of resin. I'm going to go ahead and mix this until you don't see any striations because you'll see what you'll see in this epoxy is like it's unclear. There are little like very, very fine faint lines in there. Generally, it's two to three mi uh, minutes of mixing. You don't want to be too aggressive because you don't want to introduce excess air and you want to make sure that you mix all around the sides of the container and the bottom to make sure everything's really, really well mixed. So I'm going to go ahead, fast forward this video until we get this uh, three minutes of mixing in. Now, if you're new to working with epoxy resin, you might not be familiar with the colorants or what's more frequently called pigments. But essentially, I've got my wall of color here from Black Diamond Pigment, who provides us with our pigments for here in our projects at Craft Elements. They've got a ton of colors. You can go to blackdiamondpigments.com to select your own. They've got some sample packs and everything. So I'm going to go and pick something that looks pretty good with a, a lighter colored walnut. Um, maybe I'll choose purple. I guess it's blue purple. I don't know. Seems like it might be cool. Now there are ratios and equations for mixing pigment and epoxy, but to me, I don't really follow them. A, because they kind of rely on your personal preference. For me, I'd like to start with a little, mix it in. If it's too opaque, add some more, or start with a lot if I want uh, complete non-transparency. It just really depends on your style and what you're looking for. Some people prefer clarity so you can actually see through the resin you can see light some people want a complete blackout and anything in between that is going to cause or rather is going to rely on a different amount of pigment so i kind of do it by experience but also by eyeball and you can see with this i've got pretty decent um a mix there one thing you want to remember about wood and epoxy is that wood is less dense than epoxy so it's going to float just like it would float on a body of water so what you're going to want to do is use clamps or a hand weight to pre-weigh that down in your mold and keep it from floating up got a pretty good mix going on here and i think we're probably ready to pour it in our mold And again, you'll never get the epoxy exactly level with the wood. 
the meniscus force of the epoxy is always going to have a little bit lower or a little bit higher, depending on how you've poured it, if you've domed it, i.e. poured more than the height of the mold. Otherwise, and it doesn't matter if you've got spillage on these pieces, in this case for this mold, because again, as I said before, we're taking this out and we're going to run it through our planer to make sure it's all nice and level. But literally, that's all we can do for now. Total bolt thick set takes roughly a day and a half, two days to set. Not fully here, but set, which means you can take it out of the mold, you can sand it, you can cut it, you can plane it without having to worry about it. Generally, it takes about seven days to fully cure and fully harden to its maximum hardness. So while that's happening, I want to talk about using the template to make solid wood pieces and resin pieces and wood pieces without the use of a mold. Because maybe you are on a limited budget and you can maybe only afford one or two molds, but you want to make all these different cool shapes. Well, what can you do? There's a way to do that. So I'm going to go underneath my workbench here and grab one of our demo molds. This is an 18 by 12 by inch and a half mold. And what that's going to do is allow you to make rectangular boards, well, which is great. You've got to make a rectangular board. What if you want to get to the shape? Same idea. While this is a little bit undersized, this should demonstrate it pretty well. It's very self-explanatory how you would make this in a, in a rectangular or square mold. Cut your wood on a straight angle, straight line, put it in there, weigh it down, fill with epoxy, demold it. You can then do the exact same thing we did earlier with this template. Trace it out under your wood, rough cut it, and then run this entire thing through the planer. To demonstrate that, I'm not going to use a resin and wood piece, just a solid wood piece. Because if you're one of those people who just doesn't like resin, doesn't like the look of resin, whatever it is, um, you can make solid wood pieces or even, uh, you know, glued up boards. So if you've got a board that's been glued up with multiple species of wood, you can use this to shape it. So I'm going to go over here now and show you how to do that. So the process for this is very much the same. So the process for this is very much similar to what we did with the partial wood that we were going to set in our mold, except you want to make sure that you've got wood that's obviously large enough or larger than the template. We're going to go ahead and trace this out. And in this case, we're also going to trace the handles because we do need to pre-cut those out or rough cut them out as well. So once again, we're at the process where we're going to reattach our template to this with two-way tape, CA glue tape, or hot glue in the case of my preference here. We're going to use our template that we used in the other project. And same kind of method here. I'm just going to dab on some sections of glue, enough to hold the template in place, but also make it easier to remove because we do need, of course, remove it when we're done. Lining it up with the trace marks we made earlier. Perfect. Let that dry for a sec. And my router bit is already set at that level because we set it earlier. So once this is nice and dry, I'm going to turn this bad boy on and get it shaped. Okay, same process as before. We're going to grab spatula and or screwdriver and just gently pry that template off of our board because we do not want to crack the template for obvious reasons. You can reuse these templates over and over as long as they're not broken. Okay, 
Now this is not a fully finished board, but it is fully shaped. So at this point we can proceed to sanding. We could router the edges if we wanted to, and of course oiling or spraying or whatever you're going to do to finish your piece. But I'm actually going to leave that to the end of the video so we can do them both together. We're going to look at finishing this guy and finishing the resin wood piece. Now at this point of the video, you don't want to see the rest and you kind of know how it all goes and you just want to get some cool molds and templates. You can actually see the templates and molds that we have that match, i.e. the templates uh, and molds just like these where you can pre-shape wood for the molds. All you need to do is go to craftedelements.com forward slash matching. So craftedelements.com forward slash matching will show you the molds and templates that we have in our line that match each other to allow you to pre-cut wood for said molds. We're going to come back in a couple of days once this resin is fully cured, uh, rather set, not cured. Pop out of the mold, plane it, sand it, and we'll get this project done. And you can see just how cool the final result is. We'll see you in a bit, guys. So a couple of days have passed, which means our resin is now going to be fully set and ready to remove from the mold. So I'm just going to take the weight off and I'm going to go around and just peel this carefully. And one of the big advantages, of course, of these silicone molds is just how easy they are to demold compared to like a wooden tech tape form or, you know, the HTPE funky molds that you can buy. And there you go. We've got a formed cutting board. Now I'm going to keep driving this point home, guys, but watch this. So let's just say, I put that back in there. If we wanted to make this with a rectangular mold, you could. You make the rectangular piece, you could use your template to shape it. But I want to really drive home the amount of resin you're saving by using a pre-formed, pre-shaped mold. You could probably put a spacer in there, but you're probably losing at least 30 or 40 ounces of resin, if I had to guess, between these extra spaces at an inch of depth. You know, 40 ounces of resin at the cost of a quality resin is not an insignificant amount of money. So, you know, we, we kind of push these shape molds for time saving, but also money saving. Yeah, you've got to buy the mold and these molds are not cheap, but if you're saving, you know, 10, 15, 20 dollars of resin each time you pour by using a pre-shaped mold like this, it's pretty obvious they pay for themselves. Plus, you have the time-saving ability of not having to shape it, easy to set up and easy to demold. So that's the big kind of uh, appeal of, of silicone molds. I guess you get what you pay for, um, but it really depends on, on the frequency you're making and how much your time is worth. If you're retired and you don't really care about how much something, how long it takes you to make something, I don't know if it matters what mold you buy, to be honest with you. As a mold company, I hate to say that, but it's really if you want to save time and save a bit of money that our molds kind of are, are a no-brainer. Okay, but I digress here, guys. So I've got this piece demolded, and this is pretty typical, especially when using a thin, thinner resin, where you'll get, you know, even with that weight on the bottom of the mold, you still get some seepage, and that's, you don't, you can't really avoid that. You have a porous material, wood, and you've got essentially a liquid that's like almost like the viscosity of water. So that meniscus force is just going to kind of etch its way under there and just seep through those cracks and grains to get that. But that's fine because we are going to run this through the planer. We obviously have to run this side through the planer because it is not perfect. It is, the resin is lower than the wood. So we want to run this through our bench top planer a few times on both sides and we'll come out with a piece that looks more like this. All right, let's go over and get started here. So we're kind of in the home stretch here for these boards. I've got this one all planed up and obviously this one we had pre-cut earlier and formed on the router, um, on the router table. Now I want to talk about kind of resin seepage along curved surfaces. So if you're making a board or whatever piece uh, with wood and resin and you have resin seep onto the edge, if it's a rectangle or square, it really doesn't matter. You can take that set your table saw to like a sixteenth of an inch or an eighth of an inch, take that off. But you can't really do that with a curved section like this. Obviously it doesn't make a difference here. You can see there's resin here. So we could either leave it, we could sand it, starting with 60 grit or 80 grit and going up to 120 to get rid of that rest of that resin that's over poured on the side there. However, we kind of developed this funky method, which is kind of really simple. I did make a video about this on our YouTube channel, but I've got a custom 
uh, flush trim bit here. So what we did is we have a half inch uh, blade, router bit, flush trim router bit, with a 3 8 inch bearing, okay? So the actual blade is actually a little bit wider, a little bit gr greater in diameter than that bearing is. So what that's gonna do is when we go across this, it's gonna actually take off like a 16th or an eighth inch f of this material. And then we can put our flush trim bearing back on our router table and take the rest of it off. And it's gonna get rid of all that extra seeped out resin and give us a perfectly smooth curved surface that we can work with. So if you don't follow me, don't worry, I'm gonna do it right now. We're kind of in the home stretch here for these boards. I've got this one all planed up, and obviously this one we had pre-cut earlier and formed on the router um, on the router table. Now I want to talk about kind of resin seepage along curved surfaces. So if you're making a board or whatever piece uh, with wood and resin, and you have resin seep onto the edge, if it's a rectangle or square, it really doesn't matter. You can take that. Set your table saw to like a sixteenth of an inch or an eighth of an inch, take that off. But you can't really do that with a curved section like this. Obviously, it doesn't make a difference here. You can see there's resin here. So we could either leave it, we could sand it, starting with 60 grit or 80 grit and going up to 120 to get rid of that rest of that resin that's over poured in the side there. However, we kind of developed this funky method, which is kind of really simple. I did make a video about this on our YouTube channel, but I've got a custom uh, flush trim bit here. So what we did is we have a half inch uh, blade, router bit, flush trim router bit, with a 3 8 inch bearing, okay? So the actual blade is actually a little bit wider, a little bit gr greater in diameter than that bearing is. So what that's gonna do is, when we go across this, it's gonna actually take off like a 16th or an 8th inch f of this material and then we can put our flush trim bearing back on our router table and take the rest of it off. And it's gonna get rid of all that extra seeped out resin and give us a perfectly smooth curved surface that we can work with. So if you don't follow me, don't worry, I'm gonna do it right now. So we're gonna make sure that that bearing just touches the upper surface, doesn't really matter where of this, and this blade is gonna basically trim off on anything underneath that bearing, we're going to flip it over and install our regular flush trim out of it and flush trim it to get this all nice and even. Go ahead and uninstall this guy. Swap it out with our regular quarter inch flush trim router bit. So we're just going to line up our bearing of our router bit, our flush trim bit that has the same diameter bearing as the same diameter cutter. And that way this bottom section here that we've left over, which is the width of the bearing on the last router bit, will come off. And there you go, we've taken off that extra resin. You can see a little bit of a line just from the two layers, what we did. But once you actually start sanding this, that'll get rid of it all. And I'm gonna actually show you how to chamfer the edges with a, um, a, a rounding or round over uh, router bit, which I'm gonna do now on both these boards before we actually get to the sanding and finishing stage. All right, both our boards are ready for the sanding and finishing stage. My planer blades are a little rough. They probably should have been placed, replaced a month ago. So if you have pretty sharp, brand new planer blades, uh, leveling resin, it won't look like this. It'll look really nice and shiny. It'll be way less work to sand. All it really means is I'm gonna be more, there's gonna be more effort in sanding all the rough sections and sort of little chips and stuff that the, the planer blades tug on my piece. Um, but also when you do that round over, 
uh, any sort of little chip through imperfections on the edges and the corners, you typically vanish because you're rounding it over in your router and getting rid of all that material anyway. So I don't want to focus too much of this video on sanding. It's a really boring process. I'm going to start with 80 grit. I would normally start with 120 on epoxy normally because I find that if you start with 80 grit, you end up scratching up the epoxy a lot. But because of the quality of or the bad quality of the planing uh, blades and the planer job here, I'm going to have to start with 80 anyway to get, get deeper into that cut. Um, and then I'm going to just basically move up to probably 320. I'm not going to go any further than that on the wood in particular because anything over 220, 320 grit, your wood's going to stop absorbing oil. And I'm going to just be using some either mineral oil, walrus oil, or total but wood honey to finish these off, which I will do at the end of the video. Um, if you wanted to go further to make the epoxy clearer, you could just focus on sanding the epoxy up to, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 grit and polish if you want. But for most people who are making these cutting boards, going up to 300 or 400 or 500 grit on epoxy is plenty, um, especially given the fact that you're probably not going to be charging $300 for these, so you can't put hours and hours of time into sanding. If you're making a board that's, you know, $100, $120 or less, it's really not worth your time to sand it to polished, glossy perfection. All right, I'm going to get sanding. Fast forward through the end of the video um, here on the camera because sanding is really boring. One thing I wanted to point out here, guys, that you may have seen me do in this video and other videos. Typically, wet sanding is when you combine water with your sandpaper, um, and it's typically done at a very high grit, you know, 1500, 2000 or above, that wet sanding type sandpaper, that wet sanding polished type finish. However, you'll probably notice that I often use a little bit of water and dampen my resin or if I'm sanding acrylic, for example, whether, I use, whether I'm using resin or acrylic, I'll typically start wetting the, uh, the resin, the plastic, at the 220 grit sanding mark. And really there's two benefits I found to this. One is it keeps the dust down. You'll, now I do have two big fans here, but I'm not wearing a respirator. I've also got my big vacuum attached here, which you can't hear, but it is on and sucking all the dust in here. So between the two fans, the vacuum pump, and the, um, the wet sanding, when I'm sanding the resin, instead of, you know, kind of becoming airborne, it's kind of all becoming like a paste, and then it just kind of flicks off onto the table or the ground. I find there's very, very little, if any, that gets into the air when you're using, you know, a wet surface. And then the next thing is lubrication. It's just so much easier to move your, your power sander over a wet resin surface than a dry. And then the last thing is, as a function of those two things, lubrication, um, and, and dust control is you end up with way less pilling and I call it pilling I don't know what you'd actually call it but essentially if you've ever sanded resin maybe you focus a little bit too much on one area uh, or you went a little bit too hard and it starts to melt the resin and it gets like pilly like the, the inside of a uh, like a shirt that's been washed too many times it gets kind of fuzzy and all that stuff you get a bunch of material and it's just not, it's not a good finish it's more work to fix that with your sandpaper i find that when you've applied water it keeps the resin cool the friction between the resin and the sandpaper is lower so it's not heating up the resin as much and you don't have any of that pilling kind of nastiness that you can have with dry sandpaper on dry resin i think the only disadvantage of that is when you're doing this with wooden resin is now you've got all that kind of paste worked into the wood here. So before you actually go and finish this uh, with your top coat or your sealant or your oil, you're going to want to wipe all that kind of gunk off of the wood and then you're going to want to let, let it dry because you do not want to have the surface of the wood wet while you put your oil finish on there. That's going to be bad news. So as long as you can get that, that gunk off the wood that has been left over from wet setting the resin and letting it dry, I'd highly recommend doing this. But again, I think this is kind of a personal preference thing. I like to, to make things easier. If I'm gonna get the same result and make things easier, that's what I'm gonna do. And I find that 
combining water with my sanding at 220 grit or above does that for me. All right, guys, this is the moment of truth where we actually finish this project. So I've got our resin and wood board. I've got our solid wood board that we made with our template. And I've got some Total Boat wood honey. Now, I like Total Boat wood honey a lot, not just because Total Boat sends it to us to use, but it's actually a really good product. I've used Odie's oil, Walrus oil, you know, food grade mineral oil. I find it just, it's really easy to apply. You put it on, you wait five, 10 minutes, you buff it off and it looks mint. I just think it's a good product. It's well priced and it really is just easy to apply and makes it look mint when it's done. So I'm gonna change the camera angle. You can see me apply this and see the difference that applying this stuff makes. My gloves, I'm just gonna work it all in by hand. You can certainly brush it on, but this is more satisfying I find. And using your fingers with the glove just allows you to get into every crevice you've got here on your board. You can see instantly it just really warms up the wood. It's got a little bit of a yellow tinge to it. It's not as yellow when it fully sets and dries here, but it just looks really, really cool, especially with those warmer colored, warmer tones of wood. So just a quick and dirty application. Just rub it everywhere. It doesn't have to look amazing because what we're gonna let this, uh, what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna let this set um, and kind of absorb into our wood that we've sanded to 220 grit for about 10 minutes or so. If you wait a little longer, it's fine. The key is you don't wanna to wait too long. You don't want the, the material, you don't want the uh, oil or, or whatever you wanna call it to uh, dry, right? Because once it starts drying, it starts getting flaky and then it's a real mess to get off. So you wanna buff it off before it actually starts to physically dry out. And I find that 10 minute mark is generally a good estimate of when to do that. So I'm just wiping all the excess off now after letting it set for about 10 minutes. All the extra oil and material that has been on the board here. We're still gonna wanna let this like fully dry. It probably takes, I don't know, six, 12 hours. I usually just leave them overnight. Don't bag them yet. Definitely leave them out to fully dry before you put this thing in a bag. Otherwise you'll get plastic marks on your board. But you can see just the difference there from between sanding and applying that total but wood honey. All right, so if you made it this far in the video, thank you. Uh, a couple of key takeaways. If you are looking to make preformed charcuterie boards, as well as a ton of other wood and resin projects, you're gonna wanna keep our company Craft Developments in mind. We literally have 180 to 200 different molds at this time, 250 different templates, and I think 20 or 30 at least charcuterie boards with matching templates. So you can make projects like this. And if you watch the end of this video, you probably understand the benefit now. You're going to be saving time. You're going to be saving money. You're going to be saving materials by using, and pre, uh, using a pre-shaped mold like this. Or if you're choosing our router templates, these are also going to save you time. They're going to lower your chance for error and you're going to increase your productivity and repeatability of your wood projects. And again, you can go to craftedelements.com to check out our entire line. If you're really focused on what we're doing in the video here, you can find matching molds at templates at craftedelements.com forward slash matching. The last URL I want to give you is if you are a newbie. If this is new to you and you're watching this video and your mind is just blown, I highly recommend you watch our 11 part resin wood basics video series. This is a completely free video series. It's 11 part series. It's 12 hours long into like 11 different modules, but it is ridiculously helpful if you are new to this craft. Whether you're new to woodworking or new to resin, or maybe you're an experienced woodworker and you're not familiar with resin, everything I basically have in my head here is in, on those videos. So if you go to craftedelements.com forward slash ERWBVS, Epoxy Resin Wood Basics Video Series, ERWBVS. That's gonna get you a quick opt-in. And again, the video series is completely free. All right, guys, that is it for today's video. It is definitely a little bit longer than I want it to be, but I hope you found it useful. If you have any questions, you should probably check out that Resident Wood Basics video series because it probably covers it there. But otherwise, questions, comments below, all right, in that text box and hit like, follow us, subscribe, all that good stuff. Thanks for watching. See you next time.